I'm Dr. Rita McGuire. I'm the Chief Medical Officer here at Wakana, one of the co-founders. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist of over 30 years. I attended Wayne State School of Medicine in Detroit, Michigan. I completed my residency at Cook County. I'm also CEO of RJM Wellness and Rick Rita Fitness. I'm a, a global speaker, uh, speaking about health and wellness, specifically with women. I'm also involved in the um, certifying of medical marijuana program here in Illinois. In fact, I was one of the very first physicians in Illinois to certify patients for the opioid exchange program. That's actually a program for patients in Illinois to obtain a medical card um, in lieu of an opioid. I'm also a member of the Doctors for Cannabis Regulation. So you can see that I'm an advocate uh, for this plant. So tonight is um, specifically at seven o'clock, a webinar for healthcare providers, healthcare providers who are trying to navigate their way in this space to really understand how they can use this plant, use this holistic option for their patients when it comes to treating a lot of different challenges that our patients have. So I'm joined tonight um, by uh, an amazing woman, Dr. Joy Smith, who's a pharmacist, uh, who you'll hear from after I am done. So let's first talk about one of the confusing um, parts of the plant that many healthcare professionals um, don't understand. And that is the difference when we talk about a patient wanting CBD versus a patient wanting a medical marijuana card. Um, it's important to understand that the family, the cannabis family, has two species. And this is going to help you understand, as a healthcare professional, the difference between medical marijuana and CBD. So the species that the cannabis plant has is one on the right, marijuana, and another species on the left is called hemp. So let's talk about the difference. The difference between the two species is real easy. One gets you high and one doesn't get you high, okay? That's to break it down for all the healthcare professionals that when you hear the word cannabis, you freak out, right? Don't freak out anymore. So marijuana is the part of the plant that has a very high level or percentage of THC or Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. That is the part of the plant THC that gives you the euphoria, that gives you the paranoia. Um, and then the marijuana species also has CBD or cannabidiol. But the amount of CBD in marijuana is very small. That's why marijuana gets you high when you use it. Even if you have a medical marijuana card that you're certifying for your patient, that patient will have that euphoria when they're taking that medical marijuana for their pain, or maybe they have cancer and they're taking the medical marijuana for their nausea or vomiting. But on the other hand, when your patients are asking you about CBD, a CBD is sourced, yes, from marijuana, but it's also sourced from the hemp species. And when CBD is sourced from hemp, it will not get your patient high. It would not get your patients that euphoria or paranoia like marijuana does. So, so many of our patients are really seeking and asking us for direction when it comes to CBD. So hemp has a high percentage of CBD and very trace amounts of THC. In fact, hemp is defined as containing 0.3% or less of THC. That is why CBD products sourced from hemp will not get your patients high, it won't give them the euphoria. Actually, CBD products sourced from hemp will give your patients exactly what they're looking for. They're looking for a holistic way of addressing their pain or their anxiety or their symptoms from cancer or even cancer treatment from a product that will give them benefits without giving them high. So that is the difference between marijuana 
and CBD or hemp. And it's really important that you understand so you can explain to your patients that there is a product that they absolutely can take to address issues that they're having without getting high, without having to get a medical marijuana card. So this gentleman, we all know, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, our colleague, really has made cannabis mainstream. And he made it mainstream in 2013 when he came out and he made a public apology. And he made a public apology, not only to healthcare providers like ourselves, but to the public by saying that as a physician, he really didn't do his due diligence. He didn't dig deep enough and far enough in the data and the research that really shows that cannabis is, a, is an option for our patients. It absolutely is an option for those patients who are looking for a way to treat their challenges in their life in a holistic and organic way. And so Dr. Sanjay Gupta spent years following patients and came out in 2013 and made that public apology. And so it's important, why? Because when we see many of our patients, in fact, they said the, the average patient over the age of 50 is typically on seven to eight medications. Our average 70 year olds that we're taking care of are on 10 to 12 different medications. And we all know that when our patients are on multiple medications, they have drug interactions, they have side effects. And they also have issues with in-organ damage. You know, we're seeing so many of our patients on dialysis, not just because of uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension, but many medications that cause kidney failure with chronic uses of a lot of medications, in addition to an opioid epidemic. You know, we're looking at now medications that we're using immediately post-op. You know, I do a hysterectomy. Um, you may be on the line and you're an orthopedic surgeon. You do a hip replacement or a knee replacement. And you put your patient on a, an opioid or narcotic just for that immediate post-op care. It's not intended for that patient to go six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks out on an opioid. This is where our patients get in problems, they get in trouble, and they, and they overdose and die. So another thing as a healthcare professional you should know is that uh, the FDA has approved a CBD prescription called Epidolex. Epidolex is a medication that has been approved to treat seizures in children to treat Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, Dravet syndrome, like that little girl Charlotte Fiji had, and tuberous sclerosis. But what you should know is that we talked about CBD, right? We talked about it coming from not only marijuana, but it can come from the hemp species. But what you should know about Epidolex is that it is a synthetically derived medication. Okay, so it is not a, a holistic organic CBD product specifically coming from the hemp plant, but it's also a, a CBD product that has been engineered synthetically. So that is Epidolex and that's something that we should know as healthcare providers that there is one FDA approved medication for seizure disorders in children. So again, hemp versus marijuana, CBD can come from both the marijuana species and the hemp species. But again, many of our patients who are looking for CBD, they're looking for a product to give them the health without the high. So when we look at cannabis, it has over 180 now plus compounds, or what we call cannabinoids that have been identified. These are the major players that you should know about. Uh, and again, the CBD is the major player. Why? Because CBD or cannabidiol is that compound that the cannabis plant produces that has most of the medicinal benefits. Yes, the other ones have medicinal benefits, 
but CBD has more medicinal benefits than any other cannabinoid that the plant makes. So CBD is an antibacterial. It helps to inhibit cancer growth. It is a neural protection, uh, protective properties. It promotes bone growth. It reduces seizures and convulsions. It reduces blood sugar levels in diabetics. It reduces the function of the immune system. It's helping with our patients who have autoimmune diseases like lupus, and fibromyalgia, and multiple sclerosis. It helps to reduce inflammation, it helps to reduce arterial blockage. It helps to reduce a small intestinal contractions. It relieves pain, it relieves anxiety. It helps to treat skin disorders like psoriasis and eczema and acne and is a basal relaxant. So many, many, many medicinal benefits. And you can see the other cannabinoids do as well. How does it do that? How do these cannabinoids that the plant make how does it do all that I just said that it does? And, it, and there's science behind how cannabis works in the body. And this science is called the human endocannabinoid system. This is a system that we're never taught in medical school. In fact, it's estimated that less than 6% of medical schools teach their students about the human endocannabinoid system, right? And this system was discovered in the early 1990s and this system is made up of receptors in uh, every major organ and gland in the body. It's made up of receptors in key areas like the brain, the central nervous system, the immune system, and even the periphery that keep the body in homeostasis, keeps the body in balance. So these receptors, when they see CBD, or even if they see cannabis or any of those cannabinoids that we talked about, it actually binds to these receptors. And when it binds to these receptors, I'll show you here, when the cannabinoids bind to these receptors, they send a signal. They send a signal to the immune cells or to uh, the neurons in the nervous system or to cells in the periphery to reduce inflammation or to reduce anxiety. So there's hundreds and hundreds of pathways in this human endocannabinoid system that is the science behind how cannabis works in the body. Now, if you remember in our neuro, neurology um, components in medical school and pharmacy school, you remember that signals are sent from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic out to different areas of the body. What's interesting that cannabis, it works in the reverse. It works in the postsynaptic receiving neuron and it sends and transmits signals to the presynaptic area and then it sends it out to different areas of the body. So it's a very fascinating science. It's a fascinating way that these cannabinoids uh, that the body produces and cannabinoids that we may take in or your patients may take in when they congest or consume CBD, it works from a postsynaptic to a presynaptic uh, pathway. Again, these are some of the receptors that you'll find uh, in the endocannabinoid system. CB1 receptors are present in the brain, the lungs, the vascular system, the muscle, the GI tract, and even the reproductive organs. Um, and then CB2 receptors are found in places like the spleen, the bones, and the skin. So CB2 is really, really important in the immune system and really helping that area. CB1 receptors are really primarily helping with the brain and the central nervous system. But again, every single organ and gland in our body has receptors that are looking for cannabis, cannabinoids, uh, to keep it uh, in balance or homeostasis. So where is the data? Where is the research? As healthcare professionals, we want to see the data. We want to see the research. Um, many of the research articles uh, prior to 2018, prior to the Farm Bill being passed, which now allows hemp to be tested in humans, 
uh, no longer is hemp a Schedule I drug like it was for many, many, many years. Uh, prior to that, you would have to go to Israel. You'd have to go to other countries to see the data on human. Uh, now that hemp is legal in all 50 states, you're going to see a lot of human studies uh, done out of large institutions like UC San Diego. Uh, they're doing large studies on CBD with autism, ADHD, uh, anxiety, eating disorders, seizure disorders, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But your number one source of data and research is PubMed. You're going to find over 20,000 peer review articles and data uh, by using either the words medical marijuana or CBD or cannabidiol. Um, you'll also find uh, studies, a lot of studies that they're doing with veterans. The University of Mississippi is one of the uh, areas where they've done a lot of research on veterans with real marijuana, medical grade, uh, in treating those veterans with PTSD. Also studies you'll find with uh, using the active component of marijuana, using uh, THC to help with uh, nausea and vomiting and symptoms that we uh, find in our patients that we're treating for cancer. Well, how about CBD? Because we talked about how our patients, most of our patients are really coming to us asking about CBD, right? Because they, want, they don't want to be high. They don't want to get that medical card that will give them high levels of THC they want something that they can use where they can still work, they can still take care of their children and not be high or have that euphoria. Um, there are lots of studies that show how CBD works to help with those who are undergoing cancer treatment. This is a study that shows using CBD, it helps with the nausea, the vomiting in our patients who are undergoing cancer treatment, as well as you know, CBD being used for anxiety disorders. We are seeing many, many more patients with anxiety, depression, and even suicidal ideations. Why? Because of this global pandemic. This global pandemic has caused so many, be it Gen Z's, millennials, and even baby boomers, to have an increased incidence of suicides that we're seeing, anxiety, and depression disorders. CBD in this study, which is lovely, lovely, um, shows how if you use CBD acutely, like in a fast acting product, like a, 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 a cartridge, uh, a pre-roll, something that's going to act really fast within one to five minutes, how CBD has been able to reduce anxiety, panic disorders, social anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, and even PTSD when CBD use is being used and administered in acute setting, as well as CBD in the management of difficult to treat pain. We have so many patients, right, that have neuropathy, um, chronic debilitating arthritis, really difficult to treat pain due to lupus or multiple sclerosis. Again, this is a study that shows the treatment of CBD and how it works in the receptors in the immune system, those CB1 and CB2 receptors in helping to reduce difficult pain. So again, as healthcare professionals, it's imperative that we learn about the science and how cannabis works in the human body, the human endocannabinoid system, that we look at the data there's lots and lots of data that you can use PubMed and do your research, dig deep, and be that resource for your patients when they want to know the difference between medical marijuana and CBD and how you can really help to assist them to address their challenges and our patient challenges in a holistic way. So I'm going to stop sharing and give it uh, back over or give it over to my colleague, Dr. Joy Smith who is a pharmacist, um, and she's going to uh, talk about other holistic um, data when we're looking not only at CBD, but essential oils and other botanicals. Thank you so much, Dr. Joy Smith. Take it away. 
All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Rita. Thank you for all of that information. And I know that you all learned, <clears throat> excuse me, I know that you all learned something. And like we said, as, as doctors, as pharmacists, as healthcare professionals, we really want to know about the data. So I am going to start sharing here and tell you a little bit more about me. I am Dr. Joy Smith, as Dr. Rita stated. Um, I have a doctorate, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't talk today. I have a doctorate in pharmacy from Florida a &M University, and I've been licensed in Illinois for, uh, ooh, it'll be nine years this year, um, 2012, 2021, yep, nine years this year. Um, then in outpatient, hospital, ambulatory, and mostly retail settings, and now I'm at the Cook County Hospital, as you can see on my jacket, or you'll be able to see a little bit later. So when I graduated from pharmacy school, uh, got out into the field and started working, and I knew that I kind of had some interest in wanting to do more, not just be on the traditional side of medicine, but also go over to learning about more plant-based options for healing. So I became a certified integrative nutrition health coach, as well as an aromatherapist therapist and aromatherapy really just kind of stole my heart because I'm so fascinated by how plants can really um, you know pr promote healing for uh, a variety of different ailments um, I also joined the International Society of Cannabis Pharmacists after I found Wakana because Wakana in itself is just a wealth of information when it comes to how CBD can impact um, health and so I wanted to become a member of a society or a group of pharmacists who are like-minded individuals and who also understand the value of plant-based healing. Um, because Wakana found me and I just loved it so much, I became a, a dispensary owner at Wakana as well, and I am a Ruby dispensary owner here. So love, love, love the company, love the mission, and I would love to get into this information with you all. So Dr. Rita gave you a lot of science about CBD, how it works in our bodies, the difference between CBD and medical marijuana, but we want to talk a little bit more about why people seek CBD. So pain, anxiety, depression, and in fact, sleep are some of the main reasons why people seek out CBD. So if you take a look at the cross-sectional study of cannabidiol users, um, chronic pain is one of the number one causes of disease uh, and dis disability and disease burden globally. So we're looking at chronic pain. We're looking at anxiety being 18.1% of the population every year that's affected by that in age 18 and older. And then we're also looking at 6.7% of American adults who have had at least one major depressive episode in a given year. And these numbers have increased, of course, because of the global pandemic. So one of the articles that I thought was very important was the prevalence of depression symptoms in adults before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this quote is really important to me because it kind of highlights the patients that I work with and the patient populations that I work with. So if you're anything like me working at a county hospital facility or working in underserved communities, this will probably resonate as well. Prevalence of depression symptoms in the US was more than threefold higher during COVID-19 compared with before the pandemic. So individuals with lower social resources, lower economic resources and greater exposure to stressors, stressors whether it's job loss or um, dealing with childcare because there's no one to stay at home with them while they're doing their e-learning, whatever the case is, they had a greater burden of depression symptoms. And so that's a majority of our patients, especially if you do work in underserved communities or at county facilities like I do, um, or like different hospitals that Dr. Rita has worked at working in the maternal ward. So your question may be, um, are there any drug drug interactions between CBD and prescription medications? Because we know that some of these patients are on prescription medications, but we want to provide them with a natural alternative. And as you learn more about CBD, you may be concerned for your patients like I want to talk to them about this, but not really sure what the drug drug interactions would be. Would be. And if we're addressing pain, if we're addressing anxiety, if we're addressing depression, if we're addressing sleep, whatever it is that we're addressing, there are natural alternatives. And CBD and even essential oils can be those natural alternatives. So when we're talking about um, how CBD works in your body and how it may interact with other drugs, we gotta go back to the CYP450 enzymes. Those CYP450 enzymes, as we know, break down the majority of the drugs, over 90% of the drugs that our patients are taking. So um, these six, 1A2, 2C9, 2C19, 2D6, 3A4, sometimes 3A5, they metabolize a majority of those drugs that, we are, that our patients are taking, and they do metabolize CBD as well. So 
when we look at CBD metabolism, um, 2C19 and 3A4 are assigned to break CBD down. And CBD can inhibit 2C9, 2D6, 3A4. And we know that a lot of medications are metabolized through those pathways. So one of the major ways that you can make sure that your patients do not have an interaction with CBD in their prescription medications, what do we always do? Space the medications out. There's probably medications that your patients are on now that interact with one another, but because you've done your due diligence, because you've spaced those medications out, they, they won't interact in the same way. They would have metabolized through the body before the patient gets an opportunity to have that interaction. So there is always an opportunity for you to be able to incorporate something new as long as you're willing to do your due diligence, as long as you know the benefit. And Dr. Really, Dr. Rita has clearly explained the benefit of CBD and the science behind why it actually works. So when we're talking about uh, how it inhibits 2C9, 2D6, 3A4, that is primarily in the oral route. Now there are no known medications that CBD alone can induce, um, but we know inhaled marijuana or THC can induce some of the pathways that some of the drugs uh, are metabolized through. So just keep in mind when you're thinking about drug interactions, spacing those medications out. Um, we have a host of medications that, if taken together, can interact with CBD, and these are a lot of the different health conditions that a lot of our patients have, especially when we're talking about African-American patients or people of color. They have hyperlipidemia, hypertension, heart complications. We're dealing with a lot of um, anticoagulants in terms of like warfarins, Relto, those types of things. So just making sure that we look at the, we look at the interactions, know what they are, but just um, be willing to be willing to be able to uh, suggest another way not necessarily cutting off the medications that they're already taking i do not advocate for cutting off medications that your patients are taking cold turkey and i'm sure that you don't either um, but there is a way to incorporate cbd safely so we can start to address some of those symptoms that these disease states and our ailments are causing for our patients so as healthcare professionals, I think it's very important to be well-versed in traditional medicine. But I think it's also equally as important to be well-versed in alternative medicine. Alternative medicine is uh, anything from using plant-based uh, remedies or botanicals to acupuncture, to uh, yoga, to different types of treatments that don't always involve traditional medicine. And you may wonder who's actually using it. If your patients are coming to you, who's actually interested? Uh, the treatment trends have been trending upward in terms of botanical use, and that is what CBD and essential oils fall into. Botanicals are any plants that have medicinal benefit that can, that can improve the health of a patient. So if you're looking from 2014 to 2025, you can see that the botanical use is steadily, steadily increasing. People are understanding the benefits of CBD. People are understanding the benefits of essential oils and plant-based remedies that are able to uh, address the symptoms that they're experiencing. So essential oils are those highly concentrated or aromatic extracts that are distilled from a variety of plant materials, whether it's flowers, grasses, leaves, roots, seeds, etc. They can be used to help relieve that pain, whether it's used topically. They can be used to help relieve stress, whether you're inhaling it or having it in a diffuser or even rubbing it and cupping it into your hands and really allowing those essential oils to get into the nasal cavity um, and improving mood as well. So I know one oil that I typically use, frankincense. Frankincense is very good for helping with grounding, helping with uh, grounding the emotion, improving the mood, and really decreasing that stress. So I'm really, really excited about frankincense and how I've been able to use it for years now. Now, when we're talking about essential oils, some people may say, okay, essential oils don't really help. They're snake oils. They just smell good, whatever. But the science behind how the essential oils work in the olfactory system is really, really remarkable. So when those essential oils go into the nasal cavity, they kind of get into the passages that allow um, signals to be sent to areas of your brain, specifically the limbic system. The hippocampus, the amygdala are all involved in this to affect memory, to affect um, relaxation, to affect whether you're having stimulation or being energized. All of those parts of the brain work together, and they also affect the part of the brain that deals with the emotions and, and memory. So when you're thinking about 
For instance, if you smell um, a meal or if you smell a perfume or cologne, that might remind you of an older family member that used to cook dinner on Thanksgiving or remind you of a family member that used to wear a particular fragrance. All of that is interconnected because of the signals and the transmission that goes on when you do inhale an essential oil. And that's just inhalation. Some essential oils can be taken orally. Some essential oils can be um, you know, rubbed on areas of pain to cause, to help with pain relief. There are just so many prominent resources that can uh, point to how essential oils are helpful in the body. One of them is the Asian Pacific Journal of Tropical Biomedicine. And I think that this quote is very important because it talks about how the essential oils work in the body. So they remodulate themselves once they get into the body and go to the site of malfunction. So it's like oils know where to go. They know what to do once it gets into your body. And when various permutations happen, they can give relief to numerous ailments, whether it's depression, insomnia, pain, respiratory issues, when you're really inhaling and getting it into the, uh, the linings of the lungs, skin ailments, when you have wounds or, or inflammation on that skin. And what's very important to understand is that essential oils are beneficial when other aspects of life and diets are given due consideration. A lot of times people don't want to use or patients don't want to use natural methods of healing because it takes a little longer than a, a chemically engineered drug. And that's because the, the essential oil or the CBD or what have you has to get into your body and really learn where it's going. And if it's blocked by poor diet, if it's blocked by poor lifestyle habits, that can, that can cause an issue in terms of you seeing an effect. So it's always important, just like with any medication, just like with our CBD products, just like with our essential oils, whatever it is that you're suggesting to your patient on a natural wellness and an organic plant-based room, you wanna make sure that that's accompanied with a good lifestyle and a good diet. So these two charts um, talk about the different chemical compositions of essential oils. On the left, you'll see the actual chemical constituents and the, um, the health benefit that's there. So you'll see a lot of anti-inflammatory, a lot of anti-allergenic, antiviral. And you can read this chart and I can provide this to anyone that might need the chart later. But um, there's a lot of different health benefits that we see in some of our prescription drugs. And then you go over to the right side and you can see different oils that fall into those categories and ones that will have those particular health benefits. So we're not saying that essential oils or CBD cures these things or, or treats any of these things, but they do really help to um, relieve the symptoms that are caused as a result of some of these ailments. So there's some essential oil safety considerations that I just want to make sure that you all understand. So if essential oils do come in, in as a part of your practice, you're able to really educate patients and let them know how to use them properly. Not applying to open wounds, um, keeping away from the eyes and washing hands after use and making sure that if the essential oil does get into the eye, that you're using a carrier oil to just put on that area so that the two oils can mix and you can get that essential oil right out of the eye. Water and oil do not mix, so cold water is not gonna do anything but make your patient more upset. Um, when using essential oils or anything topically, patch test the small area of the skin, an inconspicuous area that won't be seen if there's any type of reaction. Um, making sure that if the patient is pregnant, nursing, has any medical conditions or on any medications, that we just kind of, again, either space it out if it's something that can be used orally, or if it's not being used orally, for instance, and the patient is pregnant or nursing and it's an essential oil that's not recommended for those populations, it may be able to be diffused. It may be able to just be inhaled. For instance, I'll give the frankincense example. It's pretty safe. But if there's any concern about using essential oil on the skin, it can be inhaled for a grounding sensation. Um, spacing essential oil use out two to three hours between medications, especially if it's one that you're going to be taking orally and you want to talk with a certified aromatherapist like myself or really do the research to know exactly which ones can be taken orally. Um, but we know that essential oils, we know that CBD can sometimes have some of the same actions as some of our medications. So we wanna make sure that we're not overdoing it for our patients. And more is not better. Using a small amount of these highly concentrated oils is going to really yield great benefit. You don't have to think that you have to use a whole bottle of essential oil. 
and diffusing for up to 30 minutes of a time so you don't overwhelm your olfactory senses. So I just think that it's really important, like Dr. Rita said, to make sure that we really understand the science, really get into how these natural remedies can help our patients. Because if we're talking about relieving pain and we're talking about how opioids are killing over 100 people daily when they're being taken chronically, if we're talking about how um, anxiety and depression medications um, can cause even more anxiety as a side effect, but then there's another option that we may be able to incorporate alongside to lessen those symptoms. Why wouldn't we want to do that for our patients? So um, again, I thank you so much for your time. I'm so excited that we get to educate the doctors and educate the healthcare professionals by really providing the science. And I look forward to continuing this for weeks to come. So Dr. Rita, thank you so much. I'll give it back to you. Wonderful. So at this time, we will um, find out if there's any healthcare professionals on the line. If you're a healthcare professional, you can um, use the chat box to ask us any questions. If there are no healthcare professionals on the line, we will um, see everyone at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock is our business overview. Um, we thought that it would be great to have that segue for healthcare professionals who wanted to know really more about our business model, specifically more about our products, that they would join that eight o'clock call. But if you're a healthcare professional, you have some questions about the science, um, please put it in the chat. And if there are no healthcare professionals, we encourage our business partners out there to invite healthcare professionals on the line next week because this is a webinar for healthcare professionals, uh, for nurses, for physicians, chiropractors, dentists, um, psychiatrists, orthopods, um, pharmacists. I mean, you name it. Healthcare professionals need to know about this science. It's critical. And we want our patients to have a product that's safe, a product that's effective. So uh, thank you, Jewel. Thank you so much. Um, we will uh, see everyone at the eight, on the eight o'clock call. There is a question, would you recommend to help improve eyesight? Well, there's studies that um, have been done uh, on both uh, the marijuana side and the CBD side as it relates to glaucoma. Uh, glaucoma, you know, if you are CP, I'm not sure if you're a healthcare professional in a different field, but many uh, ophthalmologists have found that CBD can reduce the intraocular pressure in the eye uh, for those who have glaucoma. So uh, any condition that causes inflammation of the optic nerve or pressure on the optic nerve um, has been shown to be very effective with CBD. So if you want to know more about products and their use, Lisa, you're going to join us on the eight o'clock call. Thank you so much. Oh, I was reading a question. You see another question? Uh, yeah, it was towards the end. Is there a YouTube for new people? Jewel, can you clarify what you mean? And took CBD from a health food store. I said it was sleep. But she was on your okay, so um, Dr. Reedy, you may have experienced this with this with your patients, but Yoshiko Green says that uh, her mom took CBD from a local health store in Virginia, helped her sleep, but she was unable to take it during the day. And if she skipped a day or two, it caused her to have headaches. Is this normal? So um, what's interesting about CBD is that even in your chronic, uh, more severe cases, more is not better. So typically what many people do, if they don't have um, a amazing medical advisory board like we have here at Wakana, many people will take too much CBD too quickly, too fast. And it will cause a headache. It will cause extreme fatigue. It may even cause nausea. So more is not better. So when you use CBD, it's good to start low and to start slow. When you start 
fast and you start a lot, you'll have symptoms like your mom did. Um, and we're not sure what sort of product your mom got her hands on at a local health store. A lot of the products that you'll find at your local health store are not um, really CBD products, but they're more health uh, hemp seed products that are made with a lot of uh, fillers, a lot of other byproducts that are not really addressing the issue. So those are two things that you have to do. Get your mom um, Wakana products, ensuring that those products are tested, ensuring that you're starting low and starting slow because lots and lots of CBD too quickly, too fast will cause side effects. So we're going to end it here. Uh, invite your healthcare professionals next uh, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, this is a call for healthcare professionals so that we can really educate um, our healthcare professionals about this amazing alternative for their patients. So we'll see you at 8 o'clock. Thank you so much, Dr. Joyce Smith. I'll see you soon.